implementation of the program. Um, and uh, and so one of those one of those was was challenges with with uh, food preparation. So what we heard from caregivers was um, that children were largely choosing choosing fruit. So they had their prescription. They were largely going downstairs, exchanging that prescription for fresh fruits, and they were almost never choosing vegetables. They weren't familiar with vegetables. They didn't know how to prepare the vegetables, and so couldn't we do something so that we had a cooking class that was just for kids to sort of introduce and teach them about fresh fruits and vegetables. Um, so uh, this is a representative quote that came out of uh, this qualitative study. Uh, well, sometime you could give them a seminar or a class or something on how to incorporate fruits and vegetables, how to fix different dishes, because a lot of these young kids can't cook. So as a result of that, uh, we developed this program, Flint Kids Cook. I personally think there's a lot of special things about the program, but one of their unique parts of the program is that, the, that it's taught by a credentialed chef and a registered dietitian. So we were able to uh, develop this grant. So shortly after we completed the qualitative study, we wrote a grant for $50,000 to develop and pilot this, uh, this cooking class. So this, the chef who's here, this is Sean Gartland. He's the culinary director at the Flint Farmers Market my partner in all of this work. Um, this is our first class of kids uh, who participated in the program. We received funding to develop the program and then implemented it in October of 2017. So that was really our first class uh, of children. And the program is sort of designed like this. So it's six weeks in total. So each week we focus on a specific food group. So both the nutrition content as well as the foods that are being prepared. So um, they prepare two dishes. So two fruit dishes, two grain dishes, and then they uh, learned from the registered dietitian uh, about the nutrition focused on that specific food group. In week six, which is our graduation week, um, the kids uh, prepare a meal that includes uh, all, of the, all of the food groups, and then they uh, prepare that meal and they serve it to their families. This has been a lot of fun because we've watched uh, from the early days of the program Maybe one parent would come, maybe one sibling to teachers and godparents and grandparents. It's become so large that we actually have to shut the farmer's market down so that families can come and celebrate their children, which has really been great. Um, so this just gives you a general idea of what happens within the kitchen. So um, this is a picture of Sean. So the, all three of these boys came to the class wanting to be chefs. So um, Sean is showing them some of the, the equipment that are, that's used in the kitchen uh, that chefs use in the kitchen. So he would do that frequently in the classes. Um, this shows you the, the girls that are cooking over the stove. This is uh, Dr. Onie Nuike. So as I mentioned early in the presentation, upstairs is Hurley Children's Center. So we often would have some of the pediatric residents that would finish their day at work and come downstairs and see what kids were in their cooking and they would come in and cook with the kids, which was really nice. Also, if you can see behind Sean here, this is a, these are windows. So although parents didn't come to these classes or caregivers didn't come to the classes, they were invited to sit outside and watch what was happening. Um, something that's also very special about this class is parents largely don't leave. Um, they set, set a chair outside and they take pictures and watch their kids, which is, uh, which is great. Um, in 2018, we had, the program was very successful the first year, year and a half. Um, we were able to apply for and receive funding from Michigan Health Endowment Fund. Uh, they funded an expansion of Flint Kids Cook. Uh, we heard from caregivers that although the program was great and their kids really liked it, there's, there are many children that are not going to come to the Flint Farmers Market and we needed a second location for the program. So, uh, so we did that and you can see these four boys here are in an auditorium at Mott Children's Health Center. Um, this did, a, this did a lot. So it brought us uh, kids uh, from more North Flint uh, who maybe not wouldn't come or didn't have the transportation to get to the farmer's market. In addition to that, we partnered with Boys and Girls Club, Michigan School for the Deaf and some other organizations which were able to market the program and then uh, actually bus the children to the farmer's market and then bus them back when the classes were over. So throughout this, since October, 2017, we had about 194 kids who participated in the program. Uh, most of those children were from the Flynn area. Um, and then we've published uh, two papers. Uh, again, I don't have time to go through all of this, but just in brief, um, but one was a qualitative paper. I think one of the important findings of this was um, 
was this increase in confidence in the kitchen, but it wasn't just with the kids, it was with the parents. So the parents told us that the kids are becoming more confident cooking, but I'm a little more confident in letting them use a knife and work over a stove because they were taught by a real chef. They were taught how to cook. Um, so that was a really uh, interesting part of, the, of, of this qualitative work that we accomplished. Um, and then also, we looked at health-related quality of life. So we looked at changes in health-related quality of life from program entry to program exit. Um, and we had about 186 kids or so, 185 kids that completed these assessments. And what we found was that um, after just that six weeks, we saw really significant improvements in health-related quality of life, not just in the overall score, but in, in individual summary scores. So physical health, emotional health, school functioning. So, um, and that, that information was really uh, great for us, interesting for us. And, and those changes were related to the improvements we were seeing in cooking uh, skills and cooking attitudes. We also developed a Facebook page. So this allows us to communicate with families during the classes and after the classes. Um, it, you know, we provide recipes and uh, nutrition information and activities to do at home. Uh, we also, during COVID, almost daily, we're, were posting information about food, di food distribution sites within the community and where folks could go to access, uh, to access those. So on March 11th uh, of 2020, much like many of you, our classes were very abruptly stopped. So we had Flint Kids Cook going on. We also had introduced a new program, Flint Kids Bake. We have very abruptly had to stop those classes, paused indefinitely. And so um, once we realized that it wasn't gonna be a short stop, that this was gonna be something that was rather, rather lengthy, our collaborative team got back together. So chefs, we have a couple of dietitians, myself, and we talked about what can we do during this time to keep the kids engaged. At the time we had a wait list of about 70 kids in addition to the kids that were engaged in the class and then had to abruptly stop. So we developed this five week program Recipes are almost identical to what we were doing in the kitchen with just the kids, but the focus was really on the family. And we piloted this class in October of 2020. We asked some of the kids that had already participated in Flint Kids Cook to come back and go through the class with their families and provide us feedback and information about um, their experiences with the program. So to date, and then, we, and then we introduced the program in January of 2021. We've had 65 kids participate from 43 different families and again, uh, the majority of those families are Flint residents. So a really important part of this was our partnership. We're very lucky in Flint. We have this extraordinary uh, food hub, food aggregation space uh, called Flint Brush. And this was a separate meeting that I was in. The collaborations in Flint are just fantastic. And I, we, as we were working through trying to figure out how we were going to implement the program, the real struggle we had was how are we going to be able to ensure that families have the foods they need to prepare the recipes. The director at Flint Fresh stopped me in the middle of the meeting and said, Amy, I can do that. We, we can do this. We can work together. We'll get the recipes to them along with the food boxes. And so this is one of our participants receiving a food box. The boxes come on Tuesdays and the classes are on Wednesday and Thursday nights. Um, and then they come with the recipes uh, inside of the boxes. Uh, this is kind of what the kids see, what the families see at home. So we have a chef with three different camera angles. So uh, you can see here, depending on what he's preparing or where he is in the recipe, one of those uh, one of those three visuals will be represented to the families. Also, the nutrition education had to change a little bit because we have hands-on nutrition education during the cooking classes when the kids are in person. So that moved to poll questions, on-screen scavenger hunts, like you can see here, as well as finding foods, a grain fruit, a fruit, a vegetable in the house. We also put different and new fruits and vegetables into the boxes. And we asked the children to show what they had in their box and to talk about how they're gonna use it or what they're gonna do with those at home. All of our paper forms moved to MSU Qualtrics. So everything is done virtually, both the enrollment and the survey completion are all done um, virtually at this point. So we've gotten some really great feedback on the program. I would tell you that probably the most uh, the one thing we're hearing the most is that this is a time when families come together. So parents are working with kids. It's a, um, I particularly, this quote is something that we hear often. Um, it's an it's intentional time where there's, there's no television, there's no homework, there's no video games, that parents are working with their kids to try to um, prepare these recipes and they're engaged together. 
Um, we also hear from siblings that they're working together so that they might be fighting once in a while, but once they get to the cooking class, they recognize that they really have to work together uh, to accomplish the goals and to uh, make the recipes. We also heard some suggestions for improvement. So we talked to the parents and the kids about their experiences with the program. Some of them will tell us that they need some prep time or they need that the chefs go quicker than they can go, particularly when the kids are just learning to cook. So we've instituted some of these. You can see these are new, relatively new to our recipe cards. Uh, these are hats. So we have a chef hat for prep steps. So uh, once they get the, the boxes on Tuesday, if their class is on Wednesday and they feel like they need to do some cutting and chopping beforehand, that these are the steps that they could do, um, they could do beforehand if they're feeling rushed. Um, we also hear much in line with that, that the chef moves a little quicker than the families do. Um, and so we also instituted this sort of thumbs up. So there's critical points within the classes where we sort of catch up with everybody and say, are we here? Are we all at the same, the same spot? And if folks are, are sort of lagging behind, then we give them time to catch up until we move on. Uh, we've been fortunate uh, to get some, um, you know, good media attention around the program, which helps us a lot to get the word out that the programs are, um, are available to kids um, and that we move to this virtual format. So we had a reporter, even in the midst of COVID, who went in and family allowed the reporter and the photographer to come in and do a local story with families while they were preparing uh, the food in, in the classes. Um, we also had, a couple of years ago, PBS came and actually, uh, on a national stage, uh, highlighted a number of programs in Flint, uh, but came to a graduation, uh, kids that were graduating from uh, Flint Kids Cook with their families. Um, I hope I didn't go over, so I'm, I'm done. Um, if I don't have a chance to answer all of your questions, if you have questions, please feel free to call or email, or um, that is our website, which has uh, not only Flint Kids Cook information, but information about a number of our other nutrition programs in Flint. Amy, just before we um, move over to Susan, there is one question in the chat. What skills did you use in your pre and post evaluations? So we used the pediatric uh, quality of life inventory, we also used um, the a block, uh, we didn't report on that, it, I didn't talk about that, but block kids food screener, we used that, and then we use a cooking attitudes and cooking skills, a really brief questionnaire. Great, thank you. Sure. All right, Susan, welcome and thank you for joining us. All right, thank you for having me today. I'm going to share my screen, so give me one second. All right, can everyone see my screen? Yes, thanks for the thumbs up. Okay. Hey. Hi everyone, it's nice to meet you. My name is Susan Chen and I am currently a PhD candidate at Virginia Tech. And uh, today I'm going to present a little bit about opportunities for food waste programming. So for my outline for this presentation, I'll present some fast facts about food waste, um, why it's of interest to nutrition professionals um, currently, uh, opportunities for food waste programming, and an example of a food waste education program that I've been a part of. So a little bit more about me. Um, I am currently a PhD candidate at Virginia Tech in the Department of Human Nutrition, Foods, and Exercise. My research is really focused within the community and behavioral nutrition track. So I'm a nutrition and food systems researcher who explores the relationship between food waste and food insecurity in the United States. And I've been studying food waste for quite some time now. Uh, both of my master's thesis and now my PhD dissertation reflect my grounding as a researcher in food waste, food insecurity, and food systems. So in the United States, about uh, 30 to 40 percent of the food supply is wasted. So depending on different estimations, about 30 to 40 percent. And this is uh, has pretty great economic and environmental impact. So for economics, it's about a $165 billion loss per year, which equates to about $517 per person per year. So if you think about the food that is wasted and if everyone's wasting that much food, it's a considerable amount of money. As for environmental impact, food is currently the largest component of solid waste in landfills, which contributes to the generation of methane and uh, greenhouse gases, which contribute to climate change. 
Uh, so agriculture is also resource intensive. If people are throwing away food, they're also throwing away the resources that go into producing food, such as water, fertilizer, cropland, and et cetera. Um, one thing that I always point out is don't forget about the food packaging. Um, I know for me starting out as a food waste researcher within like the realm of nutrition, I never really thought about packaging that much. Um, but virtually all of our food that is available for human consumption in the United States has been packaged one way or another. So globally, uh, fruits and vegetables and roots and tubers account for the highest wasted food products. And if you look here at the North America and Oceania, a lot of that food waste happens in the consumption phases of the food supply chain. So compared to the other regions of the world, a lot of this waste is happening when consumers receive the food um, and don't eat it for any certain reason. So this is a list of contributors to food waste. Um, this is from a report that was published last year um, that was a strategy to reduce consumer food waste in the United States. As you can see here, the top five reasons for food waste in the United States relates to the consumer. So it's the consumer's knowledge, skills, and tools, their capacity to assess risks associated with food waste. If you go a little bit further down the list, you see that there are also some other food systems or environmental factors that impact consumer food waste as well. And this could be marketing practices of um, food companies that uh, kind of influence consumers' behaviors or some policies and regulations at all levels of the government that could also um, impact food waste levels at the consumer level. So when you think about solutions to reduce food waste, the Environmental Protection Agency has this really great food recovery hierarchy that ranks the most preferred method of wasting food or of preventing food waste to the least preferred method. Um, so at the top is source reduction, so reducing the surplus volumes of food that is being generated. Um, I'm going to touch on this a little bit, but a considerable amount, there's a considerable amount of overproduction of food in the United States. And the second solution is to feed hungry people. So this is donating extra food to food banks or um, food pantries or other organizations that can distribute food to people in need. A third is feeding animals, then industrial uses, and composting is pretty far down the food recovery hierarchy. Um, it seems like every time I talk about food waste, a lot of people mention that they compost as a method of reducing food waste, which is still better than sending it to the landfill, but there are other steps ahead of that um, that's more effective in reducing food waste. And uh, although composting is a popular method because most people can't actually feed food waste to animals or use it for other industrial uses. So in terms of the intersection between nutrition and food waste, in a, publish, or in a paper that was published a couple of years ago, these researchers looked at the amount of food that is wasted within the food system and how that relates to specific nutrients. So here I have some of the main findings from the manuscript. And about an 1,249 1, to 1,400 calories per capita per day is wasted. So there's an excess amount of food that is being produced and cannot be consumed. And then of this, 33 grams of protein and so forth with the various macro and micronutrients. I compare this to uh, the current dietary guidelines for Americans for, uh, for example, a 2,000 calorie per day diet. There's a considerable amount of nutrients being lost within our food waste system as well. So now I'm going to briefly touch on food waste within schools. So, so this is uh, for in schools, schools, uh, especially the uh, nutrition school or the school lunch program serves more than 31 million children each school day. Um, but there's been a focus lately looking at what contributes to food waste within cafeterias. So there's been a push to increase consumption of food while reducing food waste within the cafeteria. So in a study that was conducted among uh, pre-K classes and kindergarten classes, uh, about 45.3% of the food that was served to the children were wasted during one full school week. So the, in terms of breaking that down into different food categories, the greatest amount of waste was generated from vegetables, then the main entree, and then milk respectively. 
So now moving into opportunities for food waste education and programming and how you may include some of these things within your programming. So the first one is adapting existing food waste education materials. So here I have examples of what these uh, available education materials may look like. When I was working on uh, my food waste education program a couple years ago, these resources were not available. So it's nice to see that more organizations have been putting more of a focus on food waste. So the one on the left hand side here is an activity from a curriculum guidebook from the Commission for Environmental Cooperation. So this brief activity um, kind of brings awareness to imperfect produce and um, how you celebrate these foods. Um, and this, this specific activity is directed towards children. On the right hand side here is a picture of um, different toolkits that instructors or educators may use um, to educate or bring awareness about food waste to youth populations. So uh, this one on the right side is offered by the World Wildlife Foundation um, and they have pretty tailored education materials. Within each of the toolkits, there is a PowerPoint presentation, which has some facts about food waste and what it is, what that looks like, and then um, activities that are appropriate for the different age groups. Uh, so a second thing is to conduct a food waste audit. Um, this can be conducted with the people who are participating in your uh, if it's a cooking program or if it's in a school environment, uh, people who are participating in those programs to see how much food can be wasted. This has been popular within schools that are trying to measure food waste. Um, it's also a hands-on activity for the people to become involved and measure their own food waste. And then implementing policies to reduce food waste. So if food is being served at a location where nutrition education is happening, there, there could be some policies that can be put into place to reduce food waste. So I know I'm really sticking with a school setting right now because a lot of the current research has been conducted within school settings. Uh, but the one on the left hand side here is creating a share table. So some schools have implemented this during lunch periods. And if people or if students don't consume certain foods, they can put it on the share table for other students to take home with them. Uh, also, uh, there's the offer versus serve, which within a cafeteria line, the students can ask for certain items um, if they want them. And for adult populations, these are some strategies that I've seen effective in communicating food waste awareness to adults. So emphasize saving money and methods to save money and how food waste is tied to wasting money. Uh, food resource management, such as um, strategies to plan grocery lists or strategies to organize pantries or refrigerators at home. Food related practices to prolong shelf life of foods. This could be something as simple as education on how to freeze foods. Um, and then food preparation, so increased education on um, how to prepare certain foods. So now I'm going to move into uh, the research project that I was involved with. So this is exploring food waste at a residential youth summer camp. So this was a partnership between the Virginia Cooperative Extension, my department at Virginia Tech, and then the Northern Virginia 4-H Center. And the picture shown here is of that 4-H Center. So an extension agent that worked really closely with this 4-H Center said that, hey, we think there is a food waste problem going on. There's a lot of food that's being tossed every day during our summer camps, and we don't know why, we don't know where it's coming from. Would you be interested in um, taking a look at this issue? So uh, within my lab, we thought that, okay, if food waste is happening, um, there might be an uh, opportunity for food waste education here. So then therefore, uh, for the purpose of this research was to assess food waste before and after an education program at a 4-H summer camp. So all participants participated in five activities that were offered during a single 45 minute session, which was really quick. It was on one of their special activity times during their camp schedule. And these activities were all hands-on and evidence-informed. So that means that they were either adapted from existing activities or created along with the camp staff. So for this example that I have here, this activity was called Text Talk. And we had different prompts on posters that were hung up throughout their auditorium room. And when the children got to this activity, they all went around the room and answered these questions. So this was an activity that was created along with the staff members. There's another hands-on activity called Weigh the Waste in which 
the food waste amounts from the previous day were collected and then the students were um, asked to weigh what the food would look like by weighing cans of food on a scale. So that was a visualization activity. So as for food waste measurement, um, we collected baseline and post-program food waste levels using the direct measurement method. So this direct measurement method is weighing almost everything that comes out of the kitchen and then everything that wasn't eaten. But at this 4-H camp, the food was served family style. So therefore we had to bring up two categories of food waste. So the first one being consumer food waste, which was food that was served to um, the campers but not eaten, or the food that the campers served themselves from these serving dishes, but were not eaten for any purpose. And then production waste, which is food that was generated by the kitchen. So it could be excess food that was generated um, in the kitchen, that, but or produced in the kitchen, but wasn't served to the children, or it was food that was left over in these serving bowls. So this is some pictures from the direct waste method. We use bins um, to collect the food waste and to weigh the waste. So our results were pretty surprising in that we found that food waste decreased after the program, but the consumer waste, meaning the waste generated by the campers was pretty low to begin with. So for example, here, uh, if you look at the before program consumer waste and the after program waste over a week, um, so the first week we had 150 campers, not much food waste was generated. However, if you look at total waste, so this includes the production waste levels, a lot of that waste that was generated was by the kitchen preparing too much food. So this is like a breakdown of the food waste percentages by food categories. So vegetable waste was among one of the largest wasted categories. And these are just some examples of some of the foods that were served um, throughout or at one of our data collection section, sessions. And I believe this was the post-program data collection session. What we found was that many factors affected food consumption within meal times at a 4-H camp. So the biggest one being menu variability and that there's not the same, not the same food is being served every day at the summer camp. Um, we found that camp schedule also played a major role or, within um, how the campers consumed the food and that before dinner every day, there was a one hour break within the campers dorm rooms where uh, they consumed um, foods that they had bought, brought with them from home or foods that they had purchased at the snack shop at the pool. Uh, individual food preferences also played a role in um, food consumption. So as for future research, um, the research can explore the feasibility and effectiveness of a longer food waste education program within this type of non-traditional camp setting. Uh, so our food waste program was one 45 minute session that consisted of five activities. So if there was a longer program that say for throughout the whole camp week, um, then our, the results may be a little different. Uh, additionally, a larger sample size where randomization of participants is possible. So this was a very exploratory study and that we couldn't randomize the participants um, and individually track food waste levels before and after the program. And then lastly, a longitudinal studies that could follow up with campers food waste knowledge after the program and ends um, would also be interesting to add to future research. So these are some of the educational and programming resources that I've referenced in the past and have found pretty useful and uh, helpful as well. And some of them I mentioned earlier within this presentation. These are some general food waste resources that I've also found helpful and they give a pretty good background to food waste um, globally and within the United States. And lastly, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Susan, there is not a question yet in the chat, but I just wanted to call your attention to a comment from Nathan Tucker in the chat about composting and using green bins. Okay, so, so composting, so, um, this is referring to like a few 4-H centers. Thanks for sharing. Nathan. Yeah, um, I just wanted to say we uh, have green bins here. You could throw all your food scraps into which is helpful, I think. And yeah. um, you can use, I, I guess they make compost out of them. That's uh, great. 
But I was also thinking, I mean, I, I guess like, yeah, like you were saying that a lot of the food waste is from consumers, but I guess I can't help but wonder if like a lot of that is also like on the packaging. I'm just thinking of like how much like you get like a you, you get like a box of something and then you open it up and everything's like individually wrapped with like plastic and stuff like that. Just, I, I feel like that amount of waste that they use in a lot of that stuff is, they could probably do better on, I don't know. I think. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up. Um, actually, I haven't seen any studies that have also looked at both food waste and food packaging. Um, but that brings up a really great point is that things are individually packed for you know safety and quality what does that look like in the grand scheme of food waste or food systems i think that's a good point because i was just thinking that myself i'm starting a camp tomorrow in my home state and one of our requirements as per everything with the pandemic was that every single thing be individually wrapped or provided like you know condiment packets everything we can't have just the bottle that everyone is out using it all has to be individual and I've wondered a lot about food waste with some of that mm -hmm. yeah I oh. guess that's why they do it for safety but it just seems like it's a lot of waste you know I don't know it seems like they could maybe I think also about like when you get like produce at the store and you have to put it like in a you know in a plastic bag it just seems like, I don't know, there's got to be a better way, like, that may, I don't know, maybe you could have, like, paper bags or something, you know, I don't know. Yeah, these are all really great points. Um, I wonder if, like, uh, partnerships or collaborations with food retailers could help address some of these issues. There is yeah. one more comment as well, Susan. Uh, were the kids from camp engaged and eager about the food waste activities? And do you have any tips to improve engagement on this topic? Yeah, so the campers were pretty engaged in these activities because they were pretty hands-on and they thought that it was pretty fun. Um, so I think as long as like these activities can be hands-on, um, I think the kids usually um, respond pretty well to them. So uh, some of the resources that I've seen all have some sort of hands-on activity um, that are part of the curriculum. Do we have any other questions or comments for Amy or Susan before we wind up today? Well, anybody might be thinking of a last minute comment or question, I'll go ahead and do a little housekeeping too. Um, so we're gonna be having a break from 3.45 to four. And then you'll be joining the last round of breakout sessions for today at four. And then we'll do a final close out or closing for day two at 445. So that's kind of the next things coming on the agenda. Sure, and if anybody's interested in what, uh, what the next three sessions are in breakout one, we have Dr. Williams who's uh, doing her responsive feedback session. That's it's not coffee talk, it's coffee and conversation with Dr. Williams. And then uh, breakout two, which is here, we'll be having a session uh, about connecting with participants during the pandemic. And then uh, breakout three is a CIFAR coaches panel. All right, well, Amy, Susan, thank you for joining us. And Amy, I was just so happy when you showed the pictures. I got to see that farmer's market a couple of times firsthand in Flint and it's like no other, it's amazing. <laughs> Love it. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> Thank you all so much. And we will reconvene on the next things at four o'clock. Thank you. Thank you.